The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. If you ever thought about getting into business, this is a damn good show to get some 411. Without any further ado, welcome, Brett the Hitman Hart. Brett, how are you? I'm doing good. Real good. Life's good. You're in Calgary right now. What's the temperature? Oh, it's about 70 out today. Oh, man, I thought it'd be colder than the sun bitch over there right now. No, it's it's nice. It's nice and cool. Actually, these are the days are the best days of the year right now. Oh, well, I'll it's be. Perfect. So what are you doing? Are you running around? Are you, are you riding your bike um, or just chilling? I'm um, just take, taking it easy. I did a lot of traveling last week. They had the Bret Hart uh, appreciation night here last week in Calgary on Raw and uh that was a big day, and then they, had the, they made it actually Bret Hart Day here in Calgary. And other than that, I've just been taking it easy. I was in Hawaii before that. I got a a place down there that I try to spend uh, that kind of May and like well, I don't like May up here. It's May's the worst month of the year up here. It's like uh, worse than January. Hey, let's talk about let's talk a little bit about the Bret Hart Appreciation Day. How was that for you? You go back into the locker room. Uh, how long were you actually in WWE total time? Well, I was there 14 straight years. 14 straight years. You go down to WCW. You retire. You've been back, you know, several times since. But you go back in for Bret Hart Appreciation Day. And how's that locker room? How's the field? And how's the atmosphere? You know, I, I have a, a, nothing but respect for all of them. I mean, they're all, it's a different kind of group of ki- kids. I call them kids now because I guess that's what they are. And they're so much. Uh, they're smaller. They're better athletes, and they're um, some of them are just amazing. Uh, it's amazing with like some of them, like Brian Daniel or Daniel Bryan, and uh, and and Punk, and some of these guys. Some of the stuff that they're doing is like it just amazes me how they can take it another couple of inches further all the time. There's always somebody taking wrestling another over over the boundaries and. Uh, making it good again, and there's a lot of really good talent out there. I've watched the wrestlers today. Well, you know, to your point, things kind of keep evolving, just like the game of football has. Um, how often are you able to watch Monday Night Raw these days and stay on top of the current storylines, angles, and everything they've got going? Um, here and there, off and on. I, mean, I found the last few months I've, I've been sort of been watching it pretty close. I try to watch it. When I find that it starts going to too much too much backstage stuff and too many hokey storylines. I, I sort of fade off, but uh, usually I go back and check it out again. There's certain guys, like especially like second generation guys, like um, even my own nieces and nephews, like Harry and uh, Bulldog's kid and Natalia Neidhart and Kurt Hennig's kid and this guy's kid and Randy Orton. And like, I, I know all of them. I knew a lot of them when they were kids. And I kind of always root for the second generation wrestlers. Just haven't been one myself, or even the third generation wrestlers. I I just think they uh, understand the, from a whole different perspective. Uh, it's kind of like they've, you know, obviously they've grown up in the system. Do you feel like gives um, being sec- second generation gives those kids an advantage? Oh yeah, it gives them like you know, you know, just watching it. You know, I think I like I I don't know that I was ever the greatest student in school. You know, but I think that the, re- the real truth of it is, is I was a student of wrestling. Like when I got out of school, I didn't really wasn't paying more worry about my math. But when I went to the wrestling <laughs> matches that night from selling programs when I was a little kid for my dad after I finished selling all my programs I could sit right at the timekeeper table and I'd be watching Luthez wrestling Gene Kaniski and you know I'd seen the best in the world right up close and studying it and watching it and going those guys are good like you know I knew the good wrestlers from the bad ones I knew the guys that um, when, the, when guys came across to me as fake or just didn't look very real or didn't look like they took it serious um, I it came across instantly to me, and I think as a young kid, I understood wrestling. I don't. I think when I got into it, and I didn't know how exactly it worked, but I knew I had some ideas on it. I'll, always, I think as a kid, and when they finally do break you in and tell you that okay, this is how it works, usually it's, they break you into to referee. You know, it's not such a big shock. You kind of go, okay, I kind of, kind of knew anyway. Like, 
But at the same time, uh, in my dad's territory, they took kayfabe so serious that, uh, you know. Let's stop there. Let's let's go there, Brett. Kayfabe, you took it serious. These days, it's sports entertainment. Vince McMahon, you know, kind of came out of the closet, so to speak, with the business back in the day before all the exposés as when you grew up, as when you grew up, when I grew up, wrestling was real. And although you're second generation, your dad was in the business, it was very protected. What is the biggest difference in your eyes between the kayfabe era versus today's era? Um, it, I think it's it's never the same for the fans. I mean, I think all I ever tried to do is make it as real for the fans right. as possible. I never like to go with someone that I never like to be the one that gave it away. You know, like when two wrestlers were drinking together after they fought each other and stuff like that. I, I never wanted to be one of those guys that gave it away where it's like, oh, totally, you know, like that's, you know, I always wanted them to guess and think that maybe there was a little tension between me and the one guy that I did have to wrestle, even if he was in the same bar or whatever it is. I never right. ever, I always thought to, when I was a little kid, I wanted to believe it was real. And the best part about being a fan as a kid was when I thought it was real. That was when it was cool. Like it was really. Like I wanted to see the fight next week, and I wanted to see, you know. So I got. I grew up with all that sort of, you know. Again, I grew up uh, very defensive of wrestling. You know, in my family, it was the with the family business, and at the same time, it was. I don't know how many fights I had as a kid. I mean, it's it makes me laugh when I think about it, how many fights I had as a kid, simply over the statement that my dad's tougher than your dad was, was. Um, you know, pretty usually led to you know a wrestling match on the grass. Where usually I put a professional wrestling move on, like a sleeper hold or a Boston Crab. <laughs> or a, uh, I you know I remember the Sheik's move was at the uh, it was the Sheik from Detroit that yeah. was at the uh, the Camel Clutch or whatever. I don't know, I don't know how many guys I beat with that. I remember they, when I you put a kid like, on a, when you put a kid in a Camel Clutch on the schoolyard, you mean serious business, brother? <laughs> <laughs> I. I I, I I can remember thinking you can't do this stuff in amateur wrestling. <laughs> you know. Hey, let's talk about uh, when uh, Doctor D. David Schultz and talking about kayfabe and not kayfabe and back in when guys protected their business because it was their business, and you know everything was predicated on the fact that this was real. When John Stossel went back to do that interview with Doctor D. and Doctor D. I, I never met the guy. David Schultz, but he was probably a little bit on the aggressive side, and he slapped John Stossel a couple of times and really damaged his ears, but obviously a very unwise move, not a smart thing to do, but he was trying to protect the business in his way. What was your opinions when that was going down? Well, I think Dave was uh, stressed out at the time, but the the real truth of it is is that he did take pride in the business, and I think that when that happened with Stossel, his attitude was that um, yeah, I think he did it for the boys and did it right. for everybody. He thought right. that everyone would go, you know, who is this punk to be? You know, yeah, I thought he uh, he was trying to give credibility to you know, and I, I I agree that it was probably not the smartest thing in the world, but he, that's how kind of how Dave was. Dave had a short fuse and. Uh, when he got himself worked up enough, he had a short fuse and could go off on anybody. But uh, in saying that, I always thought Dave was always a, he was always a good guy to me, and I, I always felt that you just had to sort of work through that and calm the beast in him sometimes and get him back to his, back to his. But he was, uh, I uh, in looking back on that, I always. I've seen that clip back so many times, and I have to admit that uh, that Stossel did deserve to get slapped. He was. He, 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 he really had the line by a long shot. He did. He crossed the line. He had an ind- indignant tone. Uh, it was condescending. And if if you're going to do that, if you're going to take that approach, the smartest place to do that isn't where he did that. Maybe in a studio there, you know, where he had all his people around. Not that they would have done anything, but uh, I, th- I think he picked the wrong person, the wrong place, and the wrong time to conduct that interview. Right, uh, but I always thought Dave, in his, you know, in looking back over things over the years, I've always thought he was a hero to me for that day. You know, he was always a hero. Uh, it was what uh, he did that for a lot of the boys. Uh, saluted him on that one. Hey, man, you know, uh, 
I don't know how clear I was when I started this show and talking about our conversation. It's just kind of uh, two guys talking about the the business, and we're going to filter in some questions that I pulled off my website uh, that people wanted to ask you. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid. But I had to give it up because I realized it was full of sugar and junk you really shouldn't eat. I've been focused on my health for quite some time now and realized there are a lot of things out there that you shouldn't eat. I've always known how important it is to eat breakfast for a great start to the day, and Magic Spoon truly fits the bill. Magic Spoon has zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. They have four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. It tastes amazing, honestly, too good to be true. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. Go to magicspoon.com slash Steve Austin to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Steve Austin at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, They'll refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash Steve Austin and use the code Steve Austin for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast. But this this conversation is just about everything. And, and like if you and me were run, riding down the road together, and this is the kind of stuff that we would be talking about, uh, I got it tell you that I've probably never heard enough stories about the dungeon and I you know, was reading some more articles about you before we talked and your dad put, putting you in so many holes down there and uh, you know teaching you the business, teaching you respect what was the atmosphere, the vibe like because the stories that were going around was just people screaming and being stretched and punished, what was the dungeon all about? You know, it was just a little tiny room. Really, wasn't that big of a room. Uh, it was a little cement room, and then they put some boards around it so you could run into the boards, which are a little softer. They were sort of cushioned boards, <laughs> and then uh, but there was no ropes. And it was a big a mat that was a, as hard as a floor. There was hardly any give to it at all. In fact, it had boards going all across it. It was a little bit of padding, you know, not very good padding, and some. A canvas, and uh, it was stretched out over the mat. It was actually probably a pretty good amateur wrestling mat, but it was not necessarily a good bump. But you know, it had a low ceiling, it had two windows where you could kind of peek in, and which were usually broken from baseball and stuff like that. But uh, and you know, the things that happened. That, then there was a whole weight room with everything. My dad mostly hand built weights, but he did order some special weights that had the heart uh, great had the heart engraved into the side of the weights and stuff. They had. It's really nice uh, chrome weights that were sort of <clears throat> new for that time period. But, but your dad wasn't down there teaching chain wrestling. He was teaching wrestling holds and respect. Well, you know what it was? was he, he was always, he loved wrestling. He was more of a, his, his whole thing was he loved to shoot wrestling. He'd wrestle, he'd go down there and uh, he'd have whatever guys were working up here, they would come up on after on weekends when business was good in the 50s all the wrestlers would sort of party at my dad's house and you'd have a beer and hot dogs and barbecue and stuff like that and uh they'd have a big barbecue and Stu would uh make beer down in his uh, basement and uh they'd all drink beer and and wrestle all day down along in the gym the wrestlers <laughs> would just kind of shoot with each other pull around pull necks they used to call it i can remember being about three or four years old and Walking around down there with all these huge legs, like weightlifters usually big got big, huge, heavy legs. Yeah, guys, guys squatting and stuff like that. Guys like Mike Sharp's dad. Um, you know, I can remember a lot of the guys from those days. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, there's a lot of a lot of people up there. You know, wrestling around on that. Bulldog Brower was a guy that was around in those days. I remember him. And I would. That's probably about 1960 when I was about three years old, and I could probably start remembering them a little bit. And uh, you know, you just be around them. You know, you just always always comfortable being around wrestlers. You often they often drove up to my parents' house on a, on a, like if they got their check on Friday, if they needed it early for something, they'd drive up and get it and pick it up. And my mom was always um, that was one of the funny things about uh, my dad's house was that the office was right upstairs. So 
my mom was doing like doing all the work in the office. My dad would be downstairs stretching guys in the basement, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you could hear the bellowing and screaming and these groans coming from the basement all the time for for hours. And I, you know, I'd bring a friend over to the house and we'd just like go upstairs to play pool or something. And, you know, you hear all these groans. It was like a haunted house or a torture chamber. <laughs> and, you know, people be looking at you. Now, there's, there was a story about my mom one time that she heard when he, she wasn't accustomed to do stretching guys in the basement. And uh, this must have been before I was born. But she she ended up phoning the police because she heard all the screaming and stuff that coming out of the basement. And uh, how the basement came into being what it was was the, um, in the, you know, in the early 50s, Stu um, had good connections with uh, the New York Territory because he worked there with Tutsmont and all that. And he was able to get a lot of the champions to come up to work up in Calgary for the Stampede and different things and bring them up to these big shows. And wrestling started to take off with television in those days. And Stu was one of the first guys to get wrestling on TV. And my dad was sort of was ran wrestling like you like you dream it. You know, it was like this great dream for all these wrestlers and you know they're all guys that he hired and they were running around the country and they were wrestling was super popular and wrestling became popular and they bought an airplane and the guys that used to work my dad's territory in the 50s used to fly to the town you know it was like a whole different world and uh you know by the time i was born wrestling changed and wrestling uh had lost some of its um glamour it was kind of getting kind of old they could there was baseball and all kinds of stuff on tv now and you know but when my dad um, would get calls from guys, they'd, uh, you know, someone like Vern Gagne would call up and he goes, I got this guy that's, uh, you know, he's a football player, but he's, I don't know if he's got what it takes. Or, so I'm going to send him up to Stu. But so was it just the football dad. players for, for Stu to stretch, or was it accomplished guys coming in there to learn some more uh, stuff to put in their arsenal? Because I'm, I'm thinking it's purely submission holes. And, and how much of that, you know, are they going to actually use in the squared circle? Well, you know, like like I said, they, a lot of times they just bowled around. You know, he, he was like right. take on all. Everybody took on everybody, and um, he had about ten guys up there learning. You know, there'd be a couple that are football players, and there'd be a couple that are, you know, that are not. You know, they're just big farm kids, or you know, there was he. But generally, looked for guys that, um, yeah, and got referred reference. Like the guys that ended up here were guys that uh, somebody had said, hey. Check out Stu Hart in Calgary. He'll teach you how to be a wrestler. What kind of come to Jesus meeting was it for these football players who think they're all that in a bag of chips? And I got a lot of respect for football players, but Mister, when you take that knowledge and put it in there with a shooter, uh, and you're in that world, tough day at the office. How'd the football players make out? Well, you know, a lot of guys. If you look back on those days, like Wilbur Snyder and uh, Gene Kaniski and um, Ernie Ladd, and there's quite a few guys that were football players that got into wrestling and did quite well. I think it's an easy, you know, they're they're comparable to each other. It's a good big man sport uh, wrestling is for someone like that, especially if you you had to leave football because of an injury or whatever. You still got the, you know, the basics. Um, wrestling's a perfect thing for, for somebody because um, it's a lot of the same movement as a football player. Same kind of running, the same kind of uh, physical contact. What kind of, of what kind of stuff was your dad telling you? Like if he had you in a submission hold and he was stretching you, what was he telling you while he was doing that? Well, you know, they, they there's a lot of people like to describe my dad as a guy that just always tortured guys. You know, but the, the reality and the honest truth of it is that he never was like that at all. And he was generally a guy that um, he was so passionate about it. He really loved teaching anybody that would just want to learn. You could stop him anywhere, on a bus, anywhere, or an airplane, getting, you know, as long as you wanted to know how it worked for real, he would, he would love to show you. Do you he, think? He loved a good student. If someone that he started to show you how to, you know, bend somebody and bend them up into a pretzel and he's giving you sort of the fine points and how to get the guy's arm to sweep across this way or whatever, he, all these little fine tuning little tricks that he used to have. If you took um, an interest in it, uh, he could talk. He'd talk you till your ear was off. He'd talk you for days about it until you, you know. He he was he was like a, that was what he loved to do. That was that's where he really loved to do more than anything in the world was teach you submission wrestling. Anyone that was interested, especially big men, he loved to make a big tough guy even tougher and maybe even more, you know, just 
you know, he get he wanted to get, he wanted to make you that much more invincible. But obviously, that had a, a lot to do uh, with your work style in the ring. I was uh, obviously I've had a hundred matches with you. Uh, and they all were what they were, and we went out there. And the thing about when you and I worked with each other was total respect, total trust, and both guys going out there and and having a damn good match, you know, for that crowd. But in looking at your work, and I was last night on YouTube, I watch. Uh, I think I guess it was you and uh, Ricky Steamboat from 1986. It might have been at the Boston Garden. Uh, it was, man. It, it, that was a hellacious match, and just the work itself, and going back to some of your earlier matches in Calgary with you and Dynamite, when you guys are still youngsters, but just the the work itself, the tightness, the snugness, and, and you guys weren't potating each other. I'm just talking about good, solid work. If you're looking... If you're on the internet looking for some good wrestling, just look up Brett versus Steamboat in about 86. Look up anything with Brett and Dynamite or anything with Brett in general. But these are some of the matches I worked last night. I watched last night. And you, when I watch you in the ring, you can watch that today, tomorrow, 20 years from now. That is reality. That is what professional wrestling is supposed to be. Yeah, I um, I took a lot of pride in all my matches. I, I've had a lot of people tell me that I have, they can't find a bad match, even though I do know there are a few of them out there. Um, but I, most of my matches, I mean, I always, you know, whether the camera was on, or whether the camera was off, I, I always gave a hard match. I was, I never cut corners, and you know, I was always a guy that um, wanted to leave it all in the leave it all in the field every night you know just that was the way i my, my dad uh, that's the way he ran his wrestling and that's the way as a fan i watched wrestling and you know i i enjoyed uh you know being brett the hitman hard it was a good um i i just grew into that persona or that character and uh well who was brett the hitman hart the character or or, or the personality in the ring who and you know, what was, was Brett the uh, Hitman? Uh, what, what was that all about? Some, a whole bunch of different things that, and, and I think it's the same for you. you. You sort of transform over a period of time. You become this thing, but you know what? You put so much intri- invest so much of your own magic into this thing that you create, and it's the television and everything else, and the look that you have at a certain time, and it's like you, you peak at a certain time. And you know, I look back on my time when I peaked. You know, I didn't peak in, uh, you know, in 1984 and Hogan days and, uh, you know, Warrior. And, you know, a lot of ways I kind of floated around the mid card and, you know, I had the tag belts and stuff. But I was never, you know, I kind of, in a lot of ways I kind of missed it, kept this in the train or kept thinking I was. But in reality, I was, you know, when I did get my break, you know, I, um, I was still, uh, I had paid a lot of dues, but I still, um, you know, I think the timing was perfect. I really was, uh, you know, I think I felt in 92, and maybe you you would be a good person to sort of talk about all this, but, I mean, I, I think if you look at wrestling today and you see these the way they wrestle today, the way, well, the way the whole show works, the way the, the uh, sort of bending the reality and the backstage and the, making it uh, a live uh, sort of soap opera and all, like all of that has all come from Raw and the days of, you know, my generation, but uh, I think that if you really, really watch wrestling today and you're a fan of it, or at least part, you know, you still love a good wrestling match, depending on what the, what, who's working, um, I think you'll find that most of the wrestlers today are not, they didn't get their um, wrestling skills watching a lot of the, the guys before me, like, and I'm not trying to put anyone down, but like, Sort of the muscle man era and the bodybuilder era, like the Warrior Hogan, the days of wrestling being uh, one tackle, drop down, get it again, like the slow guys that weren't creating. Like when I got into the business, there was a lot of guys that were, had stopped um, stopped creating, and uh, wrestling was becoming a routine. Everybody had a routine, and that's all you did. You just stayed in the routine. And I thought I think when Dynamite came along in Calgary, we we changed that up a lot. It became like no more routines. We're gonna just add live and do stuff, and we're gonna. And I think I brought a lot, of, and I think Dynamite also did. But the Hearts and Stampede guys brought a lot of that to WWE when we came there. We started making everyone 
pick up the pace a little bit. We, you know, wrestling was supposed to be fat, bang, bang, bang. And uh, yeah, but you guys, what I noticed when I was watching, I watched about three matches with you and Dynamite last night. You guys had a hell of a pace going, but yeah, between between the bumps, between the holes, stuff in transition. I mean, when once you knocked the guy down, whether it was you or Dynamite, and both you guys were selling your asses off. I mean, it was you know Picasso and Rembrandt on the salesman uh, aspect of that match, and uh, great offensive moves. But you guys weren't rushing through the process. You were taking your time, and I want to uh, talk a little bit more about your rivalry, your matches in the early days of Calgary with Dynamite. And I want to talk more about your uh, early matches in Calgary, the Stampede Wrestling uh, with Dynamite. When we come back from this break, we're talking with Bret Hart. I'll be right back. Hey, y'all. Taking a moment to share a new podcast, True Underdog, recently launched by four times Entrepreneur of the Year award winner, Jason Waller. It's real, it's raw, it's motivational. If you're looking for inspiring stories and killer entrepreneurship advice, you got to head over and subscribe to True Underdog Podcast. Jason Waller is the definition of a true underdog. He was raised in a trailer park, suffered childhood abuse, was kicked out of high school, and became a dad in his teens. After struggling to care for his young family and hearing the words no and you can't too many times, Jason found the power within and used his street smarts to start three companies from the ground up. With his latest venture, Power Home Solar, on the path to becoming a billion-dollar enterprise. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling motivated already. And trust me when I tell you, this guy's energy is contagious. Head over to True Underdog Podcast to hear how Jason and his high-profile guests turn their lives around to achieve massive success. Subscribe to True Underdog Podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. Welcome to the Steve Austin Show. Ted, you wanted the best. I got the best. I'm talking with Brett the Hitman Hart today. Just an off-the-cuff conversation between two cats who come from the world of pro wrestling. And, yeah, I know it's sports entertainment today, but when you're talking about Steve Austin and Brett the Hitman Hart talking, it's pro wrestling. When we left off, we were talking about Dynamite Kid. We were talking about your matches in the ring, how you guys had a quick work rate, but were taking your time and telling the stories. I've always wanted to know a little bit more about Dynamite. Unfortunately, I was never able to meet him while he was still in the ring. What kind of guy was he? You know, he was, um, he was, I think, uh, the guy that changed wrestling to where it is right now. He, he deserves the most credit of anybody I, I can think of. Maybe me and maybe in, in some other ways I, I'm behind him in that. But he really changed wrestling, and uh, he was so fast-paced, and he had, he. He learned his wrestling psychology or wrestling style in England, which was rooted in actually shoot kind of wrestling right. with a lot of silly kind of wrestling at the same time, like flips and rolls and tumbling and sort right. of funny type of wrestling that people, a lot of Americans laughed at wrestlers that worked like that. But there was some guys that, you know, even Fit Finley and guys like that before that were, you know, real good wrestlers and legit wrestlers that, uh, were in the business and uh, and so in England you could go to a one show and it'd be a lot of you know ha- not very good workers say and you might go to another show ten miles up the road and it's a, it's a full of like really hard workers and old shooters and guys putting on great matches and England had a share of great workers and Dynamite learned a lot of that and when he came to uh, Calgary and uh, you know Stampede Wrestling. He um, he was always, a, unfortunately, a guy that had a bit of a chip on his shoulder, though. He was he had a small man complex. He was a small guy. How tall was Dynamite he, straight up? He was fade out, about 5'8". Eight. Okay. 5'8", which made him not very tall, but not, not so short, you know. Like he, Did he, he was, was a guy just a walk I mean, I saw him. He was like a pit bull. He was a real pit bull of wrestling. And, uh, but was he just he a was, mean-spirited guy? He was, you know, he was a good guy. He was like a mean little pit bull. Right. You know, if you made friends with him and you got to know him, he was the friendliest little pit bull in the world. But if you crossed him, <laughs> he'd bite your head off. You know, he, he was afraid of no man. I mean, I, when I right. say that, I mean nobody. He was 
he was one of those kind of guys that would go nose to nose with the biggest guy in the company over over anything, over the smallest thing, and usually just establish that uh, you know who, who he was. He, he seemed to always uh, just always um, want to be the toughest guy in the room, what? and and. Generally, he was accorded that respect all the time because he, a lot of times, pretty much no matter what, despite his size, um, he was the toughest guy in the room. He was, he was a tough, really tough little guy. When I watched you guys um, in the ring from your earlier matches back in the day, you guys were just seemingly so on the same page and had such chemistry. Was it like that the first time you locked up? Was it something that was acquired? Because just watching you two work together, there's – uh, from a, you know, <clears throat> and I coming from myself, there's seemingly almost no communication going on in that ring, and you guys are just telling the story and, you know, beating the living dog shit out of each other and having kick-ass matches. Well, you know, the truth about me and Dynamite is that we, I saw him, I worked with him, the very first, I, I had actually had, uh, I had my first wrestling match, I think, the week before, and uh, then they asked me to go again, and I said, I didn't want to go. I said, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just learning how to wrestle. I'm just, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to Puerto, I was going to Puerto Rico, and uh, but they sent me around on the road trip because they were short one guy and they, somebody else was wrestling dynamite and they promised me a real easy match with a, sort of an old veteran guy that was gonna, you know, lead me through the moves and kind of make sure I looked okay and and so I, I had it all planned. I had a whole match set up and it was really easy or at least for me it was hard. But uh, something happened, and the guy wouldn't work with dynamite. And um, they, they switched it, and they said, told me that I had to wrestle him. I said, I can't wrestle an English guy. I, I said, I can barely, I know how to take a few bumps and stuff, but I don't know how to wrestle. I only been in the, I just started. I haven't even, I had my first, I had my first match last week. <laughs> yeah. give, me, give me a break. Like, I can't do a bunch of flips and rolls. I'd already seen dynamite stuff. Right. And, um,. They made me wrestle Dynamite, and Dynamite sitting in the dressing room watching me sort of make this big thing. And I remember him telling us, "It's not that I don't want to wrestle you; it's just that I don't know how to wrestle you." But he took offense to all that, and uh, he broke me in Dynamite style. He, you know, we worked for most of the match, but every now and then he just kicked me in the face as hard as he could, or he just <laughs> suplexed me over the top rope, like right onto the floor. Or, like it was just dude. Was that a shoot? Won. Huh? Was that yeah, a shoot? That was a shoot. That, that's really one of, hurt you. Yeah, that, really, that's uh, on YouTube. That that suplex over the top rope is one of the most uh, brutal things I've ever seen in my life. That, it was phenomenal. It was, it was spectacular. If you're on the watching end of it, if you're on the receiving end of it, ah, uh, not so much. Well, you know, and sad. I say this with all with all great sadness. Is that uh, that same bump that we did perfectly that day on that show and didn't hurt ourselves. It's the same one that he did with Dynamite, or he did with Davey, or years later for a finish in Japan when they were had finally had to wrestle each other, which was a big match. And Dynamite let Davey suplex him over the top, and Dynamite hurt his back on the ring apron, and that's the back injury that sort of um, you know ruined his life. Was that the uh, was that the back injury? Because I thought it was uh, uh, in a tag match where seemingly he kind of almost tripped coming off the rope. Was that yeah, the, was yeah, that you the, heard of w- wrestling Morocco and Orton somewhere in Hamilton? I think. But that was the, the match that kind of broke the, the, the match that really did it when he first right. They came back. They carried him back to the dressing room. And they put him on ice for they put ice on his pack for about an hour or thirty minutes because he had to wait for his last. He wrestled again. He went in and wrestled. Uh, that was a Tiger Mask, but he wrestled another Mask guy and uh, won the title that week or with that time in Japan. But I mean, I just know that it was uh, he always had problems with his back, lower back was always sort of just twinging on him all the time, right till till it finally just you know it just went that uh, a few years later. I'd I'd love to talk with that guy a little bit. Uh, you know, I've seen some stuff on him. I guess he's in a wheelchair over there. Uh, but like you said, I mean, that guy really paved a way for a lot of guys to follow and was a mm, stylistically just a, a trendsetter from the you know, in, yeah, innovation the standpoint. Thing about Dynamite that I I loved about him, and I I think people kind of some people don't you know they 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 don't like him or don't have respect for him. But the truth is is that. Um, like there was always a story about Honky Tonk talking about when Harley Harley Race had uh, some kind of abdominal surgery or 
you know, um, he got had some complications. They had to take a bunch of his intestine out, and and he was off the road suddenly. And everyone was kind of we just heard about it in the dressing room, and Honky Tonk said some remark in the dressing room about, I guess he doesn't got any guts anymore. Mm. And Dynamite got up and walked over and uh, just backhanded him, knocked him off the chair. Wow. And um, <clears throat> that's what I you know, like. Dynamite was the policeman in the dressing room. Right. He didn't let any bullshit or somebody come in with an attitude or a guy that was a superstar. Like, you know, they had to come in and had to earn their rights in the dressing room with the boys, the guys that were doing the work and the guys. And he was a really good, that's what I, I mean, there was a lot of guys will tell you that's what, he was a bit of a bully and he, and he was a bit of a bully. Like, um, I can think of other situations where, where it was over the line, but, um, you know, with Jock Rougeau, for example, but. But there was times that Dynamite, being a bully and being a bit of a policeman, would straight out guys. Like that whole thing that happened years later with Sean, uh, with Sean's personality back in the 90s. The truth is, if Dynamite kid had been in the dresser, none of that would ever happen. Right. Interesting. He would have, he would have policed that and straightened that out before it became an issue. The boys don't do that. The boys have their own locker room, it's, you know, in a, to a certain degree, than, than the talent. You had to always be one of the boys first. Well, speaking of one of the boys and bringing up uh, Dynamite being the policeman of the locker room, I've heard so many stories about Andre the Giant, the boss. If he didn't want you in a dressing room, he would run your ass out. How was Andre back in the day? Was he the king of the dressing room? Because Tim, Tim White, referee Tim White, who's refereed so many of yours in my matches, you know, if, if he didn't want you in there, he would grab your shit and throw it out the door, and you really didn't have much to say about it. How was Andre? You know, he was another one of those guys. You know, they can talk about Andre, but I loved him. I, I, I understood him, and I sort of appreciate him. And, you know, he... Um, he was the kind of guy that, um, you know, you, if you respected him and you, you worked hard, and then you were, you, like you said, you, had, you, you earned it. He, he was, he was always, uh, he was always a good guy. And Andre was a great worker too. You know, oh, absolutely. Don't, don't say that a lot about Andre, but, but he was super coordinated guy. You know, and he, I can remember in the, it's just in actually it's in, in the new WWE DVD that they just did on me a few months ago. Or, a month ago, it was me and Andre wrestling in Italy, which is makes me laugh even thinking about it because I can remember going, "Who the hell put me with Andre?" And I remember like freaking out in the dressing room, going, "I'm going to a single match with Andre." <laughs> and Andre never even kept kind of acting like he didn't give a shit. And I remember like no one would give me a finish or anything. Like I said, "What the hell are we going to do?" And anyway, he finally started laughing and talking about, "Don't worry about it." And, you know, he just, anyway, I found out later that it was Andre that asked that he could work with me. He said he wanted to say he wrestled Bret Hart one time. And so we booked this single match in Milan. But I will say this much, when he when he started to drop that elbow on me from that height. Yeah. And while looking up at that body, it's like a <laughs> piano, like a grand piano getting ready to fall on top of you. And, you know, a seven foot four grand piano. Yeah. And uh, I just remember thinking, holy shit, he could kill me right now. <laughs> he, if he's off by an inch or two or just slips or just, you know, sneezes or something, I mean, I'm, I'm, I could die right now. And, uh, you know, he dropped that elbow drop on me. It was like somebody covering me with a blanket. It was it was so, um, he was such a pro. He really was. And I um, I loved working with him. I had a few my law tags and situations with him, but... He was always a pro and always, um, you know, if he told you he was going to be there on the finish or, you know, like whatever it was, he was there. Right. You know, he, whatever he needed to do, he did it. You know, I don't remember Andre, you know, and I also remember, you know, it's funny that you remember these stories, but I remember that my first day in WWE, WWF back then, was with the Dynamite Kid. They flew us down for Brantford and uh, Poughkeepsie TV tapings, one in Toronto and one in uh Poughkeepsie or close to Toronto, but anyway, the, we went to Poughkeepsie and uh, we landed at the airport in, in LaGuardia, and then we got some other little airline to uh, White Plains um, or uh, to to um, Poughkeepsie. <clears throat> and when we were in LaGuardia, I remember uh, the three birds, all three of them. Um, they were all passed out around the uh, the gate. Oh no! 
and they were so. I remember we left without them. The plane, but you couldn't open. They couldn't open the door of the plane for the pilot and everyone else to get on because they were all cocked out against the door. And I remember they missed the plane. They never showed up. And uh, I think actually it was a couple of days later that the same thing kind of thing happened, and they showed up in Providence, Rhode Island, and they showed up about an hour late into the show, and they came in talk, giving some excuse about being late. They were. I think clearly had been drinking and whatever else they've been doing. And as soon as they walked in, Andre just said, "You're fired." To all three of them, he, you know, all three of you guys are fired. Andre said that. He goes, "You're fired." And I remember Michael. I remember Michael Hayes give a cut and a promo on him, going, "You can't fire me. You're not in charge and all this stuff." And and uh, and Andre, I heard Andre goes, "You'll see tomorrow. It's either you're gone or I'm gone." Oh the shit. Next day, they were all fired. Oh shit! Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know he he was one of the boys. He was tired of them coming late, and they were they were bullshit, and they were getting away with it. And he just said enough, you know. And uh, he was a professional. He didn't like guys that weren't, you know. Bam Bam was another guy that, uh, you know, when uh, he had some big gates, he got some matches with Hogan. I think right off the bat, he just come in from some. He was a brand new guy and uh, young guy. Making huge money with yeah. Hogan on top, and he started bragging and bragging in the dressing room about what he made and who, who, how great he was, and this and that. And he was talking out of his ass for about, uh, about you know, for a couple of days. Andre wrestled, made him sure he wrestled him in the garden. Oh, Andre no. kicked him around like a soccer ball for about thirty minutes. I mean, it's cool. <laughs> a soccer ball. It was. It was it, he manhandled Bam Bam, who was a fairly. I think fairly, you know, tough guy. But oh, absolutely. Andre, when he got mad at you, you didn't want to be on the wrong side of Andre. Well, I mean, there's nothing you can do with a human being like that, that big. And, and pre-back surgery, before, you know, he really kind of started going downhill, I've heard stories of some of the stuff that he did in the ring, you know, standing on a guy's hair and wrenching his arms up just because, you know, it was kind of, you know, tortured him a little bit, but just kind of, you know, let them know with no uncertain terms that he didn't really like that particular person. And there wasn't anything you could do about it. He was too big and powerful. You know, I, I, um, I, I couldn't imagine, um, uh, like Andre, well, you know, just, it was a good thing that Andre was as good natured as he was. Did you ever drink with him? Oh, all, all the time. Uh, it got to be kind of a, kind of a normal thing. I think everybody drank with Andre, but, you know, the truth about Andre was that when he, when he was at the bar, if, um, you kept bothering him or something like that. You, you know, he would ignore you. Like wrestling fans kept coming up and asking for his autograph or tapping him on the shoulder. He would never turn around. He would never look at him. He never. He just completely and totally ignored them. And finally, they would lose it to the point they would they would cut promos on him, and he would still just ignore them. He just shut everybody out. And I realized that the poor guy never gets it. You know, people bother this guy every everywhere he goes. Right. And I don't think they understood how hard it was to be Andre. And uh, I always allowed him that. You know, I I uh, wrote a funny story in my book about my brother Smith driving us to the airport in my car, funny enough. But I, I remember it was like we had to rush Andre to the airport. We had to get him there for a plane that was leaving, like, right away. And uh, the plane was missed, was long missed when we were driving to the airport. But my brother Smith drove about Oh, God, I, he drove about 120 miles an hour to the airport. And, Where was uh, Andre? At 5 o'clock traffic. And Andre was in the passenger seat. <laughs> what kind of car Andre, was it? It was a big Cadillac. Yeah. Big uh, 76 <laughs> Rome de Elegance. It was a big, heavy-duty Cadillac. I'm sorry, Andre was in the back seat. I was in the front seat. And my brother's driving my, my, da my dad's Cadillac that he gave to me. And he drove it like an absolute idiot to the airport, like just through stop signs, red lights, you know, <laughs> side of the road, everything, to, in driving about 100 miles an hour. And he got to the airport, and he ran in with Andre. And then we, um, I remember when we went to the airport, there was a big ramp. If you ever see the Calgary Airport, there's a big sort of curved ramp as you're going up the airport uh, to the next level. And we almost went over, I swear. My brother took that corner so fast with Andre. 
we were on uh, two wheels, and I remember the car actually started hydroplane that go up in the air, and then we crashed, kind of came down, and we screeched to a halt in front of the American uh, departure or whatever, and uh, Andre got out of my car. He was so mad, he slammed the door. Just about, you know, he was, I never saw him so mad. He got out of the car. He was just steaming. And uh, he went in to try to make this supposed flight that he knew was missed. And uh, my brother came out about 10 minutes later. The police came out. I remember they were going to arrest me. And I remember I said, to explain the whole thing. It was my brother Smith driving. And he was trying to drive Andre to get him on a flight. And I kind of talked the cop out of giving him a ticket. But I mean, Andre was so, and it rightfully so, because I was right in the car. And I know how scary that ride was. And we really did almost go over that ramp. He wouldn't talk to my dad, and he wouldn't talk to my brother, any of my brothers, including Nolan, forever again. He wouldn't talk to any of them. He started talking to me only after I sort of made friends with him. So he didn't say thank you for the ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in all fairness to Andre, I always understood that, I mean, shit, that was a scary ride. Uh, and he's got every right to be, had every right to be mad. Hey, uh, I, uh, before you came on the show... <clears throat> I sent out on my uh, Twitter account, Steve Austin BSR. You can follow me on Twitter at Steve Austin BSR. And you can follow Brett at at Brett Hart on Twitter. And I sent out some uh, <clears throat> information that you were going to be on the show. And if you had any questions, just send your emails. We're about to go to break. But before we go to break, let's answer a couple of these questions and then come back and go all the fan questions so that the people who participated in this show can uh, get their question asked and answered by Brett Hart. What is your most cherished moment in the ring? Um, and I know that's a tough one because there's a lot of uh, special moments in your career. Uh, it's hard, really hard. It is really hard to say, but I probably got to say um, maybe winning the title um, the first time. Right. You know, I just think uh, even though it wasn't the greatest match or it wasn't the great, you know, it wasn't, wasn't it wasn't anything that I, you know, if I could have planned it, you know, but at the same time, uh, I think it was the most important. I mean, that was the big night. That was, um, if somebody could have told me that uh, someday when I got into wrestling, I would reach that pinnacle, like really be the champion of the world. I would have, I mean, I, I think if I sort of somehow could have known I was going to get that far, I mean, I just, it seemed like such a far off dream. I mean, I, when I really. You never saw yourself that, being the heavyweight champion of the world. No, not really. It was like that would be in my deep, farthest dreams. Like, and that's what kind of how I looked at it too. It was like, geez, but that, that was the craziest dream that I ever had came true. I am the champion. I used to write wrestling magazines, draw the pictures. I had the belt on. I was the champion. <laughs> I took on everybody. My little wrestling magazine was WWF. Um, I fought my brother Owen in the wrestling magazine. It was really funny. All the stuff I drew when I was about thirteen years old, and because you, know, you know I like to draw. Yeah. But I draw these magazines with myself and different brothers as champions. And but Owen was the one bad brother, which was funny because he's the one that used to laugh about that because he used to read my magazines that I used to draw as a kid. And it's you know all this stuff kind of end up play, playing out for real, you know, uh, or at least for a while there. But it was I, I, I've lived a very um, you know I know I've went through a lot of stuff with Owen and passing and Bulldog and a lot of a lot, a lot of sad tragedies in wrestling. But, to be really honest, I, I've, I'm very uh, happy with what I got from wrestling. I got a lot of great memories, and I had a lot of great times. And uh, I, you know, I hope that uh, anyone that does read my book uh, appreciates that it's more about all the good stuff I did. You know, yeah. One of the things uh, also about your first one of, one of the other things about your uh, when you first became champion there in WWF was it was a transition because prior to you, it was a big man's game. Yeah, that's what I was kind of saying earlier. Is I think that the wrestlers are today, they didn't grow up watching, you know, um, Dusty Rhodes, and they didn't grow up watching Hulk Hogan, and they didn't grow up. They watched. They grew up watching Bret Hart, and that's why they wrestle. That's the way they wrestle today. And I think you know the generation that uh, Vince referred to it in that thing last week on Raw, that Bret Hart night, but he mentioned it as sort of uh, the Bret Hart era. But I, I do think that we. You know, when I became champion, it wasn't about how I didn't have 24 inch arms. You know, I wasn't six foot eight, and I didn't look like Warrior either, and I didn't look like, you know, even Macho Man was um, kind of different. I was, 
I was the first sort of mid-sized guy to get sort of really, um, maybe Randy too. I think me and Randy were the first ones to really right. start making it about the wrestling. And, um, you know, I, I don't think people remember me necessarily at the time. Cause I, you know, I got sort of st- stuck with a belt at a funny time in the business. You know, Hogan had uh, got question on steroids on the Arsenio Hall show put him in a funny light and steroids became a big thing and Vince had his trial and they thought he was selling steroids to the wrestlers and it was uh, sex things going on with the ring crew that became headlines and the business was in a kind of in a bad slump. Hogan sort of jumped out and left everyone abandoned uh, the wrestling because he was going to do Hollywood or and um, there was those saying like where's wrestling go from here without Hulk Hogan and uh, I think to be really honest, I was the first real, like, this is the way wrestling is going to go without Hulk Hogan. It's going to go with Bret Hart, and we're going to go into wrestling. We're going to go completely the other direction. And go it did. Think, and the, 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 the gears in the game of professional wrestling never stop, and uh, it's always going to keep rolling. Doesn't matter what your name is, who you are, uh, and that's what, such <clears throat> what makes the business so interesting. The machine never stops. Sometimes the parts fall off, or sometimes the parts are replaced. I'm talking with Bret the Hitman Hart. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. When I come back, we're going to go to fan questions and talk a little bit more with the one and only Bret Hart. You own or rent your home. Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Welcome to the Steve Austin Show. California, Steve Austin talking to the hitman. And let me tell you something. If you're looking to buy something online and you want to support the Steve Austin show, here's what you got to do. Go to podcastone.com and click on the Amazon banner on the Steve Austin show page. Doing that gets you to the same Amazon place you normally go, but with the bonus. Amazon kicks back a small percentage of the sale to help support the show. That means more Steve and fewer ads to pay for doing this. All the prices are the same. They don't jack nothing up. You just support the Steve Austin Show. Thank you. And moving on, I was deep in conversation with the one and only Brett the Hitman Hart. A lot of you fans wrote in and asked questions. This entire last segment is going to be your questions read by me and answered by Brett. And we're going to start it off, Brett. Are you back with me here? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Well, let's, let's start it off with this. All right, trim that out. Okay, Brett, during your time in Stampede Wrestling, who would you say was the most legitimately tough guy on the roster the whole time you were there? And that's from uh, Patty over in Liverpool. Patty in Liverpool sent that. Well, there were a lot of legitimately tough wrestlers all the time. I mean, being tough isn't something you just go through, period. You know, like, really tougher. But I think... You know, my dad used to always say, um, you know, a lot of guys felt that Haku was one of the toughest guys in the dressing room. I've always yeah. heard the name Haku. Everybody that uh, has been around says Haku. Are you confirming that? I'm just saying that my dad used to always say, ah. you know, I'll imitate him. He'd say, I'd like to see the guy that's going to take earthquake off his feet. <laughs> And I, you know, I think about it and I go, undefeated sumo wrestler, undefeated amateur wrestler, undefeated in every kind of type of wrestling you can think of. Not too many guys pushing Earthquake around. Yeah. Yeah. Earthquake, pretty tough guy, huh? He was, he was super tough, man. I think, um, I, I don't have any doubt he would have gold, been a gold medalist if he decided he wanted a gold medal, but he, he he was undefeated Canadian heavyweight champion. No one even touched him. No one could beat him. He, he had, you know, if you ever look at him, he, he was a big guy, big fat, like a heavy guy. 
But he was he built like fun. a built like a mastodon, though. He was big boned and heavy. He some, you look at his legs. Look at his legs. Yeah, they're like tree trunks, man. They're like like, like those ones in Oregon that are big redwoods. They're like huge. There's nobody pushing him anywhere. I don't even know if an elephant could push him too far. <laughs> that would have been a damn good WrestleMania <laughs> match. Hey, we got another question. Uh, this is, uh, let me see, this is coming from Khan. Brett from Khan in Oxford. Got a lot of people from England. Uh, love the Hitman. They're writing in. Uh, people are listening to the show all over the world. Brett, if you were in 100% top shape, who would you most like to get in the ring with and feud from d- today's WWE roster and why? Well, you know, the, the guy I would love to work with the most would be Cena. Uh, I would love to have wrestled them, and it'll never, it could never happen, you know, just so everyone knows, but it could never happen. But it, ideally, he would have been a great, um, you know, and Steve would appreciate this. The, the villain, the heel character that I sort of became in 97, that, that Bret Hart, the one that was bashing Canada and with the Canadian flag and had the attitude and all that same character against John Cena today would be a great, uh, if he could morph them together, that would have been a great match. I think I would have really, um, I would have had some great psychology and great way to tell a story. And uh, Cena was the great, perfect hero to go against, you know, that hitman character from that era. You know, I, I would love to have done that. And in saying that, and it's sort of the same thing as uh, what happened with me and you. You know, when I think of when you and I worked, Steve, that was the beauty of it, is that, that you were, the rest of them was going through this change, and uh, they started liking the, the, the badasses, and, you know, the guys like John Cena, they're starting to get tired of cheering for the same old sort of, you know, the guy that's number one baby face of the company kind of thing. It's like, you know what, we're not buying this guy, and we're not going to, we're going to go against the grain. And this, it was a whole transition that's never been, you know, I don't think, um, anyone could understand how hard it was. You never sometimes knew what you were going to happen to go to certain towns, and no matter how bad you get, they cheer for you, and no matter how good right. uh, you try to be, they boo you, you know, and uh, that whole trans, that whole period, and how we, how we sort of switch places, and sort of, I always tell people, you want to understand great, great working, and great psychology, and great, two wrestlers appreciating the circumstances that, what what's happening in the business around them and how to sort of I think it's a really um it was such a great time. I mean I, I know we've talked a lot of times about that match, but I really think there was some great art being made that's never been they'll never duplicate that art, that the artistry that came from that time period. It was really um you know, it's amazing because I know that in Survivor series when we fought you and I, we we tried so hard to make that the greatest match of all time like we really gave our all for that so when it was over it was like that we did everything we did everything we could think of every move every bang every you know i thought we took it to the edge and then all of a sudden the way i remember when we got worked at wrestlemania 13 it was kind of last minute and kind of like okay well we'll just slap bret hart and steve austin together again you know they got kind of a building thing going and it's like yeah, but we just worked a month ago kind of thing. It's like, well, we're going to work again. And it's like, well, we're going to make it a no-holds-barred match. And, you know, I remember at the time thinking no-holds-barred, that takes out pinfalls. So that makes it even more boring and more harder. You know, we're not going to have the same, you know, and I remember thinking of the match I had with Bob Backlund, the I Quit match, which I thought was my only really disaster match I ever had. But anyway, so I, I, I don't think anyone ever realized I know I didn't that um, you know that that would be such a great match. I think going into it, I thought it was going to be awful hard to come up and try to duplicate what we had already done before. Well, you know, when you're talking about that match and us going back together so soon, I just uh, injured my knee. I was in San Antonio. I was off. It was about eh, two or three weeks before uh, WrestleMania. 13, and I was at home watching Monday Night Raw when it, when Vince made the announcement that in a submission match in the semi-main would be Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret the Hitman Hart. I was watching TV. 
I am in the match. I just found out about it. The submission match totally pissed me off because, you know, I didn't have a whole arsenal of offensive moves anyway, and I damn sure didn't have any submission moves, maybe one. So I was petrified and mortified and pissed off. You know, of course, I hadn't been in the company really long enough for them to consult me or ask if it was okay if they booked me in a match. But I was hotter than a son bitch. And I don't want to talk too much about WrestleMania 13 or any of our matches because I want you to come back and I want to spend a total show on those because I want to discuss certain segments of time that people can go back and reference as we pick through those matches. But your answer about John Cena and working with him, I totally see that. But also, I, I love the heel aspect of Bret the Hitman Hart from way back back in that 86 match with Ricky Steamboat. And I think Steamboat had actually requested to work with you. Was that true? Um, I don't know. Uh, Do you I remember the match I'm talking the, about, though? The, the match that you're talking about was the, we got news that we were working at WrestleMania. And they, Correct. And they booked us in Boston, and they booked us in Washington, D.C. to get to sort of get comfortable with each other, get familiar with each other. And so the match that you watched was the very first match we ever had. But that night in the dressing room before that match, they came in and said the match got scrubbed. During the, they told me I was in the Battle Royal now. And that the Steamboat match was going to be Hercules and Steamboat, which oh. in the end probably was better because Hercules ended up doing a match with him about 30 seconds long, which and jobbed out to him. And that was like, wasn't even worth the trouble. I would have hated doing that. But, but if you. Switched it. But if you go back, anybody on a, a YouTube to, to watch this match, that was 1986. Was that in Boston? That was in Boston. You know, the beauty of that match is that we never worked with each other before. And we're, oh, that know, thing was a thing of beauty. Worked. It's just, it's, it's seamless. It, it's so snug. And the timing is there. And that would have been Steamboat versus Bret Hart in Boston in 86. Catch that on YouTube. And you kind of uh, brushed upon the next question sent in from Marcy. And, and here it is. And since you brought up my name, what was it that you saw in Steve Austin that you knew you wanted to work with him and give him the rub he needed? You know, uh, without uh, you know going to a big long, you know, blowing a lot of smoke up uh, up your up your ass kind of thing. I mean, the truth is, I mean, I remember going to Vince and when you were stunning Steve and going, "Why is this guy not here?" And, you know, Ted Vince was going, "We don't have any." I remember Vince office said, "We don't have anybody for for you to work with." I go, "Why don't you get Steve Austin?" You know, because I used to bring your name up a lot. And uh, and I used to bring up Benoit's name a lot. And there's certain guys in WCW that I used to bring up their names. Why don't you bring these guys in? They're, they're they're free now. They're not working for them anymore. And uh, Vince would always think about it, but uh, you'd never see him bring them in. And all of a sudden, one day, there was Steve. And it was like, uh, finally. I, mean, I even told Steve that story when he first said, I've been asking him to bring you in for, since, for, for like a two years now. And, and, you know, I was a big fan of Steve before he got to WWE. And... You know, and I always tell people that tell me, they go, you know, you made Steve Austin and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, that's not true. No, Steve but you were a big part of the making process, and, and I'll never forget that. And, and you got to call a spade a spade. Would I, would I have been okay without you? Hmm. Yeah, most likely, but that you, you can't take that, you know, you just can't take that component out of my career. You were already the hitman. You'd already established greatness, and you would continue uh, to go down the road that you did. You were already a made guy. Uh, feuding with you and you handpicking me uh, for that match uh, in Madison Square Garden. And I remember I told this story with Sean when he first came on the show uh, back in the day that we were in Houston. It was at the uh, Houston Summit. I'd wrestled Sean in about a mid-card match, and uh, you had watched the match, and I remember you came up to me afterwards, and you said, hey, man, that was a good match. He, and you said, I'll work with you any day. And so you were a big part of uh, helping make me, and some people sometimes people don't understand the rub process. Certain things have to, have to happen correctly uh, during some time for, to get – people over guys don't get over just because they're over it's a whole process of going through the process so working with you was you know imperative for my career to, to end up the way it did and with the feuds and the storylines i mean you you couldn't have scripted a better story from really start to finish of, of the stuff that we did i just remember a lot of the um like the stuff you i think you, you used to sometimes Say the odd comment about my dad, 
you know, but old man Hardy down in his basement or whatever it is, he'd say something about him. You know, it would light up my dad so much he'd get a big smile on his face. <laughs> you know, he he would love it, and I and I always and I was uh, like we had such um, good promos. Considering we were two guys that really um, got along pretty good, but our promos, I think, whenever I watched them, I, go, I was really in my zone. Like I, we had a, we seemed to understand each other's characters perfectly. How to always make each other's characters and keep pushing pushing and I, I like when I look back to those days and the promos I was doing with you I, I think they were and yours in particular was like you were ahead of your time there you're just you were just getting your uh just getting familiar with where you were going and uh you know I I um yeah I always tell people and this is true that once I left WWE, I wasn't really a fan of um, wrestling so much. I didn't. I tried not to watch the show in that. And the only guy I watched was was you. And I always always love all the stuff you did. Even with Vince, I'd shake my head and go, "Yeah, I love it. That's good shit." <laughs> you, know, you know, damn. You know, I, I I it was like the only character that to me that really went back to my childhood of what a wrestling villain. But I think there's even a couple of Bugs Bunny cartoons where they had a wrestler that looked a lot like what your gimmick was. You know, the muscle. You know the look, the whole, the whole thing. You just, um, it's just, you know, you were always. Um, <clears throat> we always had a good chemistry together in the ring too. I, I do remember you working with Sean uh, all over the place in Texas and little towns, and I don't even remember the names of them, some of them, but I do remember kind of peeking over like barn doors and stuff like that to watch you work and, and coming back and saying, "Yeah, I want, I want to work with you sometime." And, um, you know, and then whenever we did work, I think we always, um, what was where we worked well. I know, um, I think that I, what I did for you a lot of the time was, uh, I think you wouldn't, you know, if it's fair of me to say, I think when you first got to WWE or when you first got to start working with me, you were still a little, um, you kind of go on or I'd go out of, you'd spit out of control sometimes. Like you get a little, you got going too fast. You get you end up somewhere you didn't know where you were yeah. in the match. And I think I was good at kind of teaching you to calm down, relax. It's not the whole match isn't screwed up. We'll just go back to this part. Now we'll pick it up again. And I think I really taught you how to pace yourself better and just take your time. And uh, and I, I noticed that years later, I was like, yeah, you, you can tell, like how much you've improved like from that from the time period when you first worked with me in say Survivor Series to even when you worked with me at WrestleMania 13 you know the timing and the, the understanding of how we worked and you know really just the that was just two guys mostly playing off instincts of each other's characters and it's like I love how we started it I love how we how we duked it out all the way through I always think that is what that's what this whole business is about is um, what we did in that match is that's, that's the greatest art of pro wrestling that I can think of. This is the Steve Austin Show. You own or rent your home. Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. But, you know, when I go back and watch stuff, and I'm just so hypercritical of anything uh, that I see or do, and in picking apart the current product, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't mince words. It is what it is. And I'm just passionate about the business. I was watching part of that match uh, last night. You had uh, hit me in the corner. I was hanging from the turnbuckle with both arms. You spun me around, and that was when you started giving me those big haymakers. And I kicked you between the, I kicked you right in the balls, and you went down. I started using the ropes to pull myself up, and the, and the match continued. But when I was thinking, watching that last night, I was thinking, golly. You could have stayed down another 30 seconds. 30 
real seconds, I could have, is who I'm referring to, then started yeah. pulling up those ropes. And we had that crowd right in the palm of our hands. But that was just the greatest natural double down that, that could have happened, and it was. And when I look back and nitpick it, I should have stayed down for 30 seconds. That's what I think. You know, I always tell people, like, when I fought Bulldog in Wembley, and it was like, I remember going through the whole match with Davey, and it was a long story about the match, but I remember at the very end, I told Davey, I said, make sure you, when uh, when when, the, when we get up at the end, I said, I'm not going to shake your hand. I'm going mean, to make like I'm a poor sport. I'm going to keep making out, I'm going to leave, but just keep giving me that, just keep staring at me like, come on, you're my brother-in-law. Yeah. You know, it, come on, you're, the, the, you know, I, I beat you fair and square, and I'm offering my hand. Just keep keep looking at me with the big puppy dog eyes, and I'll just keep getting like I'm going to leave, like, fuck you, kind yeah. of thing. And I told him, I said, we'll have that place, we can have that place, I'll have that 82,000 ready to start crying if we do it right. And you know what, I remember, it's a little thing, but whenever I watched that match, I go, you can't, I couldn't get David to look me in the eye. And every time he did, he turned, he started trying to work the crowd. Yeah. And I kept saying, you idiot. Hey, the drama is with me. Right. With me. Look at me. Don't look at the crowd. Don't look at Diana. Don't. And he kept, and I remember I finally, you see me, I just finally throw my hands up and I just walk over and I hugged him. Because it was, it was like, he didn't get, he forgot. Right. Never did get it. And it was like one of those things that I can just tell you, what a, you know, when you watch that show, Bass, as much great as that match is, it's the little details and, uh, you know, another thing that I do remember is when, uh, um, you know, when you and I worked, and we we always um, always had good chemistry. You know, we always always got along very good in the ring, and uh, you know, I don't think that uh, I don't think we ever didn't have good chemistry in the ring. Even uh, on that DVD that just came out, they have me and you working in uh, South Africa. I don't know if you've seen that back in a while. I haven't seen that. I remember that match. I thought it could have been better, but I remember one time, and, and I did enjoy that match in South Africa. I think I was a little blown up from the travel schedule, but one time we were working in Kuwait, and I think we worked a string of shows together there, and you and I were always, are you, are you laughing? And you might know the story I'm about to tell. We're always dead serious in the ring. And and for the first few years uh, when I was in the business, I mean, I, I didn't think you could smile. I didn't think you, you were supposed to have fun. I just thought you were supposed to wrestle. And me in a competitive en environment, man, I have killer instinct. I'm just out there to compete. Well, hello. Finally, I learned how to relax a little bit and to loosen up a little bit and have fun out there. And when you're having fun... The people are having a good time, and it doesn't matter how serious the angle is. It's just you being you and in the moment, whether you're heel or babyface. doesn't mean you have to smile. You're just having fun. And so I was out there playing a little bit of Gaga that night, and I was trying to get – I was I, who was the referee in that match? I said, I bet I can get Brett to crack. And that's when I started flapping my wings like a chicken. And you barely laughed, and you always used the back of your hand and your hair to cover up your smile – and I almost busted you. Do you remember that? I do remember a match with me. Uh, I do sort of remember that. I, and I remember uh, maybe it was the same week or same day. Within, I think it was a three-day trip. So um, I remember Owen being in a match with uh, – and maybe you were in it, maybe you weren't. But I remember whoever was in it with me, he, he was all um, hijinks and – he was pretending to smoke while he had guys in head scissors. And <laughs> yeah. He was pulling all his all his shtick out, all his funny little <laughs> gags where he's taking the funny bumps and he'd call high spots that were impossible to do. And, and I just remember I remember laughing on the apron so hard. <laughs> I almost uh, was, I think the hardest I've ever laughed in the ring was in, in that match. And uh, you know, it's not very often that you can. You get a chance to, like you said, to, to 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 laugh every now and then. But you know, I remember right with Kurt Henning, I always had a spot where he'd call out some kind of a duck the elbow cross body, and then under any kick out, and I'd roll under the rope, and we go into a big series of high spots after that. But I remember the first time we did it, I dived a little early, and he was a little too far back, and. You know, anyway, <laughs> I end up kind of hitting him around the shoelaces with a big crossbody. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we both started laughing. And it was like, and I think the match turned out to be not, not one of our best matches anyway. <laughs> yeah. so 
that was the very first time we worked and we always laughed about doing that spot so that every time we did work we did it like that anyway and they would always kick out he'd kick out and i'd be laughing my head off under the bottom rope and i'd come up and i'd hit him with a tackle and i'd go through these all these high spots where I'm, he's bumping and taking arm drags and i'm coming up and hip tossing him and it was a, a lot of complicated stuff and I, i'm laughing all the way through it so i took him over in the headlock and i remember lying there panting in the ring just catching my breath and we'd both be just laughing our heads off and uh you know it was fun out there sometimes it wasn't, a, it wasn't always um what people think it is hey confirm a story for me we're, we're gonna wrap this thing up after this story I always heard a story, I think it was before I came in a company, and everybody knew, and we'll cover this in more detail next time you're on the show, but uh, Owen used to pull ribs on everybody, and he kept the whole crew laughing, whether you were in the ring, and he could also have a great match in the ring, uh, but when it was time for a little bit of ha-ha, he was that guy, and through the airports on the road, everybody laughed with Owen, but one time, I guess it was like a battle royal situation, you guys are overseas, I want to say it was India, and somehow... Owen snuck a ba bunch of tuna fish into the ring, and while you were on the mat, stuck the tuna fish in your mouth and had you in a camel clutch. Is that a true story? <laughs> yeah, I think that is a true story. What happened? Uh, I, I can't remember. I don't. I think it was a little more subtle than that. Uh, I think he. I can't remember, but it doesn't. For some reason, I'm thinking it was true. What, okay, so what was the best rib Owen played that you saw? Well, I think the best one was uh, the best one was the one with um, for me anyway was the one with my dad and Reg Park. You know <laughs> what um, happened? Reg Park uh, used to wrestle. He, used to, he was one of the first guys to make uh, championship wrestling belts. Give a little uh, yeah, history he made on Reg Park. Yeah, years and, the, and really nice ones. Yes, really nice. He was and a he standard was a bodybuilder. He, was, he had a really good body. He had a really good physique and was a, you know, fairly uh, respected bodybuilder before he got into wrestling. And uh, you know, always took good care of his body. Always was a good athlete and stuff like that. Pretty mild, kind of timid guy, but not a shooter or anything like that. And uh, Owen could disguise his voice just because if you met Reg and Owen only met him a couple of times, they went through Phoenix and stuff. Like that. He's living Phoenix. Yeah. You know, Stu Newland loved him, and he, every once in a while he'd come up and visit Calgary because Phoenix is kind of Calgary are sort of uh, twins or whatever. And they, you know, Reg would come up all the time and say hi at different times of the year and, you know, passing through. And so we kind of knew him, you know, a little bit, knew that he worked for my dad and knew who he was. And I remember WrestleMania 4, I think, and in New Jersey or something. I brought my dad down, and he was in a big suite with me and one of my kids in a room. And, uh, he had a big long night shirt on. He was having a great time. He was, he was with his first WrestleMania, and he was meeting different guys and wrestlers. And and uh, Owen decided to call him. It was first thing in the morning, and uh, we were just getting up and having breakfast and stuff like that. And my dad's in his night shirt, and uh, Owen decides that he's going to call my dad up from the lobby of the hotel to pretend he's Reg Park. And he he calls up, and I answer the phone because it was my room, and. Uh, he, just, he fooled me. You guys said, who is this? And he goes, it's Reg Park. Can we talk to your father or something like that? And he disguised, he did sound just like Reg Park. Yeah. I handed the phone to my dad. And I go, it's Reg Park. And my dad gets on. It's like, he's, how the hell are you, Reg? And Reg, how you? You know, they're laughing. And Owen's kind of playing along with it. And they're having a couple of good chat, chatting away just like the real Reg would. And, and then all of a sudden, Owen just turns on my dad. And I go, well, it's do. You never had the guts to, you never had the balls to try me or something. <laughs> that was what it was. You never had the balls to try me. And he kept saying it to Stu and calling Stu, calling Stu out on the phone and uh, calling him uh, that he never, that he, he wanted, <laughs> wanted, to, wanted Stu to fight him in the lobby of the hotel. And <laughs> <laughs> I just happened? remember seeing my dad's face while he was holding the phone. First, it was like, how the hell are you, Reg, and all that. And a minute later, it's, Reg, if you'd wanted to try me, why didn't you try me? <laughs> and I remember he got so worked up. I remember he, he Owen kept taking it further and further and further <laughs> until it got hysterical and he couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and my dad kept getting more and more wound up until I was actually like, I think I might have to step in and take the phone from him. <laughs> and all of a sudden, 
my dad, I remember he slammed the phone down on the bed, sat on the bed in his <laughs> nightshirt. I remember he was just shaking his head, and he looked at me, he goes, that lousy Owen, he got me. Because <laughs> Owen finally just said, it's me, Owen, I'm pulling your leg. <laughs> and it was, you know, it really was the funniest, I think, that he ever did. He got my dad big time. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, man. It makes me laugh thinking about it. I know. That guy, he he, uh, he made uh, a lot of people laugh. I tell you, going through the airports, <clears throat> sometimes we're dead dog tired, and, and he'd pull a rabbit out of his hat and do something, and everybody would start laughing. But All right, spent an hour and a half talking to Brett the Hitman Hart. Brett, will you come back and join me on a future edition of the show because we've got so much more to talk about. I want to go into specifics about... Uh, several of the pay-per-view matches we had. We touched on them briefly, teased a little bit, but break them down in details and nitpick them. Steve, I'd love to come back. It'd be great to chat. We hardly even got started. It seems like we talked for about 15 minutes. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. New to Podcast One Sportsnet, Michael Irvin and Ron Jaworski. The MIP. I am the MVP of the MIP. I am Michael Irvin, and I got a great show. It was a shock. It was a shock okay. to the system. <laughs> <laughs> I went to practice the next day. I made every tackle. No big deal. Any other coach out here, you lose, you will leave too. But let me tell you what I pulled out of last week. It made me say, oh, that's a playmaker right there. Y'all saw it. I'm the guy, right? I'm the guy. I'm the guy. Look out! Trouble is coming. (laughs) Hello, everyone. This is Eagles Hall of Fame quarterback Ron Jaworski, and I am so excited to bring you the hottest new podcast for the NFL and gaming. Welcome to Jaws Picks, featuring me, Ron Jaworski, as I give you my expert analysis and predictions of each and every NFL game. And you could hear the quarterbacks like it was a practice. And, man, I was just loving hearing the quarterbacks call everything at the line of scrimmage. You know, they've kind of solved some of their problems over the last couple weeks, man. They were getting gutted on defense, but that's 53.3% correct against the spread. Download new episodes of the Michael Irvin Podcast every Thursday and Jaws Picks with Ron Jaworski every Wednesday and Friday on all your favorite podcasting platforms.